When the film adaptation for A Silent Voice was initially announced, my biggest worry wasn't what story elements would be cut or how the character designs would look in motion, but rather, how are they going to go about representing a deaf person with music? My friend Joe over at Pause and Select has a video on the original comic, and he made the point that the lack of sound inherent to that kind of storytelling helps us empathise with the subject matter. Since audio and linear time can only be implied with static panels, the drama surrounding a deaf girl and the attempts to communicate can be felt in the fundamentals of the medium itself. However, a film, which is 50% sound, would need to take a more practical approach. When Shoko first introduces herself and reveals that she can't hear, we get a collection of distant, arrhythmic piano keystrokes. Each note suspends a fragile atmosphere, but the spaciousness of this cue doesn't just make us focus on the instrument's sound, but the sound source itself. A piano may look and sound pristine from the outside, but under the lid you'll find it has its own silent voice, so to speak. There's the noise of hammers hitting the metal strings to produce the note, the dampers that rise up and down to start and stop the vibrations of those strings, and sometimes even the practice pedal which lowers a piece of felt in front of the hammers to muffle the tone. The composer for this film, Kensuke Ushio, actually disassembled an upright piano to set up a microphone inside. What it picked up is an undercurrent of noises that occurs not just when a key is pressed down and the mechanism activates, but also when it's released and everything falls back into place. Deafness, or at least the impairment that Shoko has, isn't necessarily the absence of sound as she can feel the vibrations around her body with a heightened acuteness, even if she can't process them. Ushio understood that her hearing aid acted as an amplifier to help her with that. But all amps create their own noise and so the source gets distorted. What should be relatively simple, diatonic piano writing is now wrought with this uncomfortable sense of intimacy due to the sheer closeness of the mic. In spite of this, a silent voice has this recurring harmonic idiom that always manages to create a sense of warmth. Whenever we're in the key of D major, we almost always get this plagal sounding resolution. Usually a G major add 9 or a G major 7 going to the tonic D major triad, gently rocking back and forth. To me, this kind of chordal movement is quite relaxed in terms of harmonic momentum. Not too conclusive, but still comfortably in a major tonality, without having to add any sharps or flats to notes in the home key. Combined with the internal piano sounds, it creates the score's most memorable effect. Something that's bright without being happy, and gentle without being kind. <laughs> As the film is called a silent voice, it's tempting to say that this deafened piano sound is an analogue for Shoko's own deafness. However, the original Japanese title, Koi no Katachi, closely translates to the shape of voice, which has a more universal meaning. These internal piano sounds help define the physical shape of the instrument itself, highlighting sounds that we usually consider the byproducts of pure music. It's a means of emphasizing the masks and walls we put up around ourselves to keep from getting hurt, the lack of perspective upon encountering something new, and our incomplete interpretations of other people. So even though this D major idiom maintains a sense of emotional honesty throughout the film, this so-called imperfection in the sound, this inherent failure to understand and be understood is in no way limited to Shoko, yet her being there unintentionally highlights everyone's hypocrisy. But where is everyone in this new film adaptation? Both versions of this story have many side characters, but the serialized nature of the source material allowed each of them to get significant coverage, mostly with the purpose of passing out their own personal struggles to run parallel to Shoya himself. And while they do all spread their wings in the film, the feature-length runtime would never be able to give them closure on the same level, lessening the interpersonal drama. However, having seen her two other films, director Naoko Yamada isn't as interested in using characters for the sake of plot progression, but instead fleshing out the characters with a heavy emphasis on subtle audiovisual cues. She's described herself as a method director, intensively trying to get into the character's shoes by giving her work a lived-in and tactile sensation. But while Keon and Tamako achieve this visually, I think A Silent Voice is the first time that level of tangibility was achieved musically. 
In interviews, she said she was closely involved with the music's production, even suggesting various visual influences, such as paintings, for the composer to try and interpret into sound. I don't think there's much point in interpreting his interpretations, but it's clear there's an attempt to reconcile a sense of authentic sound with Yamada's signature visual techniques, creating a sensory experience beyond anything she's ever worked on. Of course, perception doesn't work like an on-off switch. That D major chord progression I mentioned does eventually get embellished and developed into more cohesive tracks, but it's the way the attack of the notes are altered that coincides with the state of Shoya's self-isolation. Although this blurred feeling doesn't go away that often, sometimes a bit of clarity comes along in the form of a xylophone. Such as when Shoya finally finds a friendless loner he can relate to. At the amusement park, the mic focuses on the strings more than the hammers that hit them for a gentler effect. The D major progression returns again, but this time with an affirming sense of levity that Shoya hasn't really felt before. As a contrast, when his past is brought up again for the whole class to hear, each noise has a staggering weight to it that drags the harmonies further and further down. This forethought may come as a surprise, since Kensuke Yushio's background is predominantly in techno, and even this film has some overlap with his solo work. The texture is often a loop that gets established and repeated before other instruments get gradually overdubbed above and below. However, the only time the film does try to create a totally seamless synth-based effect is when Shoya begins shutting people out. But if we were to go back to Shoko's introduction, you'll notice how the notes are unevenly spaced and laid totally bare with seemingly no association between them. But if you pay close enough attention, it's actually Bach's invention in C major. Bach wrote his collection of inventions specifically for teaching his keyboard students, and this one was at the very start, the absolute fundamental exercise for learning how to make separate voices interact. Yeah, they're literally called voices. That's the term for a single musical line in traditional Western composition. As incomplete as it all sounds, this is ironically when the music is at its most cinematic. Instantly responding to on-screen developments while blurring together the voices of the invention, as well as the characters. <laughs> Many composers and teachers from throughout history and today have a background in piano. It's the only instrument capable of coordinating rhythmically independent voices at once with such versatility, all by itself. With such a wide range and dynamic capabilities, it can recreate the texture of almost any ensemble within a single tone color, making it a blueprint for so many kinds of musical expression. Whether it's the flair of a small band or the majesty of a full symphony, interacting voices are the basis for how we perceive music as we know it today across genres and nationalities. And it's the physical apparatus, the mechanism of the piano that the microphone amplifies, which makes this all possible. All the player does is control the speed of those hammers. By the end of the film, when everything's coming full circle, the invention is played how it was originally intended. Oh. Oh, oh. It's still very under-tempo and lacks much phrasing, but at last we have two clearly distinct voices that interact with and harmonize one another in perfect rhythmic unison. This isn't just a film that uses music. The interaction of silent voices becomes music. There's an overwhelming sense of uneasiness and vulnerability in the face of something that's so simple, a sense of resonance that anyone can feel even if they can't explain it, even when they choose to ignore it. As Leonard Cohen once sang, there is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. For Shoya and Shoko, that means the people around them. But for us viewers, it's all the languages present in this film that transcend words. There's the focus of a lens, the temperature of color, 
the subtlety of body language and even the meaning behind flowers. The shape of voice is the medium itself, the forms that contain ideas and put them into motion. It makes too much sense then that the shape of music in this film is what so much of our musical understanding is built up from. A humble upright piano. Thank you.